exhibits and uh, and saw and visited with some of our exhibitors and sponsors uh, and had an opportunity to uh, to, to partake of uh, some of the really cool exhibits that we have uh, including uh, the self-charging stations and and other types of you know the, the Tesla advances uh, that are there present at the at the event today. Uh, I'm very excited about this next event, and we specifically chose something uh, for right after lunch that was a little bit more exciting. We know how the uh, the circadian rhythm can go after lunch. You need that little cup of coffee. Uh, and so this is something that we think is going to help wake you up. Uh, it's an exciting area of hardware, and one of the things that, about this area that I think is really, really kind of pertinent to everything that we've been talking about today um, and the last couple of days is that, you know, what we, what we have really kind of in, in our environment is uh, things that have been developed a, a, a long time ago are now really reaching and exceeding a tipping point, right? You know, in this building, we had VR systems 30 years ago uh, for silicon graphics. Uh, we created the first virtual human. It was called Adam, uh, the anatomical uh, um, uh, man that was, uh, we, uh, there was a, a, prisoner that donated his body to science, uh, we froze him and sliced him into 50,000 slices and recreated it. Uh, it took a visual computing system, it took a workstation uh, to actually put it back together and to do VR back then. And now we have VR via these mobile devices that we all have in our hands. So it's really changing the, the way that we see and that we are. And so with this panel, you know, we're, that we've titled uh, XR, uh, New Ways of Seeing and Being, we're really looking at how this momentum of this industry, of these advances, uh, is going to actually change and impact um, you, our lives, our days, our, and, and, and all of society. Uh, so please join me in welcoming our XR panel to the stage. Come on up. And I want to uh, introduce and thank Evo uh, Henning. Uh, Evo is a chief movement officer uh, for her open EXO. Uh, Evo uh, actually stepped in uh, at the last minute. Um, Amy Peck uh, was uh, uh, unable to make it today. So really appreciate uh, Evo being here. Uh, she's an experienced XR designer and developer and, uh, and has been in the transmedia and XR spaces for a number of years. So thank you all, and I'll, I'll look forward to this panel. Thanks for joining us, everyone. And thank you, Beth, for having us here at HardwareCon. I'm going to introduce you to our amazing panelists today. Number one, we have Michael. Yes. So Michael <laughs> Ludden, as you see, Hello. Principal yeah. Augmented Reality at Bose. Next, Tish. To shoot, we're going to let our let our panelists introduce themselves in just a moment. And Michael Carter, uh, Michael Carter is an educator and also works with Lifelike. So we're going to have a seat here. Uh, we are going to explore a bit of the integrations between XR and the field as it's emerging and changing, AI specifically, uh, the different types of technologies that show up in our full stack experiences across the board. And then we're going to talk a little bit about where these fields are going, integrations, and some applications and use cases. So I'm hoping uh, each of you can take a little bit of time and introduce yourselves. Um, for those of you I haven't met, my name's Evo. I have about uh, 20 years of experience in mixed reality. I consult, I produce, and I have a special effects hardware company down in Los Angeles. So uh, Michael, please tell us about yourself. That's OK. Uh, so Michael Ludden, I, uh, I've been in sort of the XR space since I'm, I'm the Johnny come lately to this group, uh, since 2016, right before the launch of all the consumer facing uh, VR headsets. Um, recently joined Bose to help stand up um, Bose AR, which is an audio first augmented reality platform. I'm sure we're gonna get into the details of what that means here um, and doesn't mean. Um, so the platform itself and then also a developer relations program around that, it's all net new to Bose and it's just kind of the wild west. What is augmented reality when you're not using a screen? when you're leveraging another sense, um, so it's really exciting. Um, and my name's Tish Shute, and I'm director of AR VR at Huawei Technologies USA, and I'm the co-founder of Augmented World Expo. But 
A little disclaimer, I am actually speaking, the, all of the opinions I offer today are my own. They don't represent any company, other company or organization. They represent me. And I think I have a very, I'm probably one of the few people in the world who's managed to spend their whole career on augmented reality. And I managed to do that by getting involved in visual effects for film and television very, very early in my career. And my first startup was a motion control robot for film and television television. It's a six degree of freedom uh, robot that could run on a railroad track. And you can, in film, you can layer effects on real life, live footage just as you can in the real world, you know, by exactly using, you know, matching and putting your effects in precisely the right place so you don't see matte lines and it seamlessly blends a virtual scene with a reel. So that was how I began. In, and how I basically began with spatial computing because that was a real-time spatial computing problem. We used a real-time operating system. Since then, jump a huge amount of things, but um, got very interested actually in AI quite early on because I was fortunate enough to work with Will Wright, um, who's one of, if you know him, he's the creator of The Sims and SimCity, and probably one of the great masters of AI long before it was easy and commodified. And now I would say I'm very much a full stack person. I'm very, very interested in what I see in the future, which is going to be a transition from electronics to photonics. And most of the hard problems in the hardware of AR, VR will be solved in this transition um, from, you know, from basically electronics and conventional optics to optoelectronics and photonics. So, that's my hardware interest now, but I'm very broad ranging and I think we were talking, most important thing is that why are we doing this? And why are we doing this? Why I do it is we're aiming to make, the, to give humanity new ways to communicate that improve our ability to communicate and collaborate. That's really important. So maybe a good time to hand off to Michael who actually does this. Yeah, well, I, <clears throat> I was a history professor back in the 70s and um, Somebody taught me how to program so I could write a simulation so kids could role play a situation in the French Revolution. And, and, and ever since I've been uh, working on it with uh, startups and I even worked for a big company when it was a small company, Apple. Uh, but now I work with startups all over the world. And it's all about, for me, it's all about using whatever the emerging technologies are to improve learning. and. Um, and VR, I met Jaron Lanier in the mid '80s, you know, and I've been so I've been kind of holding my breath for 30 years to get uh, to, to see virtual reality pay off in a school school situation, and uh, it's starting to happen. I work with a company that was uh, originally uh, a video, uh, video 3D video game company, and now does these beautiful interactive. 3D models, dinosaurs, and molecules, and space stations, and and it's just it's really exciting. They, they have it in HTC Vive. They have it on a tablet. They have it on the on the browser. Uh, they have augmented reality. They have Microsoft Hololens. And it's just it's really fun to watch all these kids playing with these new technologies because it, they they like science because it's fun and it's interesting. And they don't have to try to interact with a dead tree and with type on it. You know, it's a fundamentally different experience. So it's starting to feel like a lot more fun than I thought it would be 30 years ago. So as we were preparing for this conversation, we began talking about the capacities of uh, new sensor technologies, for example. And I I'm curious, uh, how many of you work in the XR space or consider themselves somewhat literate in XR? Okay, um, it sounds like most of you may not even uh, necessarily be in this space, but adjacent to it. Uh, each of you work in spaces that are also adjacent, whether it's augmented reality or, or full stack integration of these technologies. I'm wondering if you could speak to uh, useful applications and where you're seeing, uh, for instance, these technologies coming to bear in terms of people's hands in everyday life, whether it's learning or in other use cases. Uh, so I guess I can I can kick it off, um, and this is by way of explanation of what Bose AR is as well. So 
Uh, what Bose is doing is uh, shipping wearables, including, I don't know if you guys have seen, there's a new form factor we put out there, which are sunglasses that have sound. Um, so it's a Bluetooth headset, essentially, that are also sunglasses. Open ear directional sound. That's the first device that we put Bose AR in, and Bose AR is basically a sensor bundle. Uh, so it's a, uh, a magnetometer, a gyroscope, and an accelerometer. Um, I'm sure the company wouldn't appreciate me saying this, but you could imagine like wearing a Wiimote on your head and the functionality is potentially similar. Um, it has a lot of the same level of quality of sensors as you have in your mobile device, um, but ultimately it pairs to a mobile device and an application on the mobile device has to run and it can take advantage of whatever sensors the device has. So um, the frames were just the first form factor we shipped it in. We've also started shipping them in the over-ear headphones that are really popular and we're gonna be shipping them in every wearable form factor we make going forward. And really the value to Bose is literally what you just described, which is um, can this ex sort of experience provide some value for Bose customers? And is that a reason that maybe they would choose Bose over a competitor in addition to the sound quality and the other aspects of, of, of the Bose brand? Um, and so an example of a potentially useful use case that I talked about uh, in our prep for this, um, there was a company called Naviguide, sorry, Navisense, and they created a mobile application called Naviguide. And uh, to time things with South by Southwest, where we made our first announcements about the available Bose AR applications, they developed a Bose AR feature, which is essentially audio Yelp. So using the GPS from the phone and compass heading from the either frames or whatever Bose AR device you're wearing, you can understand where somebody is uh, in the world and then what direction they're looking in. And, and using just that information, you can say, okay, we think they're staring at this restaurant. And without ever having to take your phone out, if you have the application running, I could be talking to you, be present in the world. Um, we could say, do you want to eat there? Okay, let me check. Double tap, and it'll pull in data from Yelp, and it'll say, oh, okay, that's bangers. It's three stars and, uh, out of uh, 500 ratings, so let's, let's pass on that. And I haven't disconnected myself from the world. So that's one potential use case for the platform. And we're really looking in travel and fitness, um, uh, therapy and recovery, a a gaming and entertainment, um, <coughs> accessibility, education, all of these different areas, it's so greenfield, like what does a spatial audio interface look, sound like uh, without a screen? Um, and so we're really kind of casting a wide net there. But it's all about the usefulness. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think, you know, one of the things that I'm a little sad about in AR, VR is the kind of narrowing it down to um, an, uh, either an eyewear experience or a gaming experience. Um, I actually, think of myself as someone who works in spatial computing. And that's, that's why I like this title, because essentially it's really about new ways of seeing and being. And you know, spatial computing, what's at the heart of AR, VR, is basically reality is the platform, whether you're doing yeah. sound. And I will tell you the thing I'm most excited about in the world right now is the work of a young designer in Oakland called Brett Victor. And you can go, go visit or look at it on the web, but it's called Dynamic Land. And while it's not exactly spatial computing in terms of you know, six degrees of freedom, that project is exactly about redesigning how we use computing for collaboration, for communication, and how we code. It's focused on changing the way we code. And, awesome. and basically, everything hangs from, hangs from the ceiling. It, no one needs eyewear. I mean, this is a concept of, of I suppose you can say, you know, AR, because AR, um, it is, it's augmenting reality, that actually says, we don't want screens. We don't want eyewear between us. If we, why, why would we put that friction? And I, I, I would have to say, my, my most exciting feeling about all of this is that we, that the real place for AR, VR, and spatial compu computing is, is really fundamentally giving us a better way to communicate with computers. Because what we've done to ourselves is we've, because our computing was fair, has been fairly early up to now, is we've confined human communication to the bandwidth and the pixels of computers. We don't need to do that anymore. Now, computing needs to support our high bandwidth modes of communication. So if you go visit Dynamic Land, you will not find that you have to <laughs> be, have lots of people sitting in front of screens and, and in little rows or cubicles. You will find people acting like normal human beings with each other, coding together 
and not having to you know, reduce their natural human bandwidth. So I do encourage everyone to think of it this way. I, I mean, new ways of seeing and being, um, XR, AI, and spatial computing, because these things all connected, you know, the, I mean, you know that it's coming to your Alexa soon, don't you, and things like this, things that are in your home now that are just very primitive devices mm -hmm. will become spatial computing devices. And we've got lots of work to do to think about what's the, what is the, what are, that's the question that Dynamic Land asks, is how can this technology actually support human beings, mm -hmm. not how can we reduce and fit our incredible ways of communicating into pixels or separate ourselves with screens. So that's my big thing at the moment. <laughs> and yeah. I think it actually segues to, <laughs> to Michael. Well, I, I uh, spent a lot of time about 10 years ago studying how kids learn in, outside of the classroom with uh, about two dozen ethnographers. It was funded by the uh, MacArthur Foundation in uh, Chicago. Learning today among kids is really a social thing. And what I found with these new technologies is the kids get stuff, get access to stuff that they couldn't otherwise have access to. In some cases, it's places that they can go on virtual field trips. In some cases, it's things that don't exist anymore. So. Um, I have, there's a great video of these kids in, in the Czech Republic with the HTC Vive on. I mean, real, real short people. And they're, they've been walking basically in Jurassic Park or swimming with a great white shark. And they just find it really exciting. And uh, the reason I laughed is because in the video, they're interviewing one of the kids afterwards. And he keeps turning around. He's got the headset up, right? He keeps turning around and pointing like the dinosaurs are still there. And... Um, they gave a, a headset to a woman, a young woman with muscular dystrophy, and she went swimming with a great, <laughs> a great white shark, and her mother broke into tears, and her therapist said, this is something she could never do. She could never swim. And, the, and so that woman, that young woman, was engaged in an experience that she'll never forget, and all of the kids that do this stuff, they, nobody says, like the would-be gentleman, you know, you're speaking prose, nobody says, you're doing science, but they are, and they're having a great time. So I, uh, and I use the AR in, in some of the lesson plans I do to, to put kids, uh, project a skeleton on them, or project a circulation system, or do you, do you actually know where your heart sits in your chest? So you project a heart where, where it really is. So it's, it's an experience that you can't, the kids can't have in real life, so they have to have it in virtual life, but it turns them into scientists instead of readers. Absolutely. So you're speaking to the power of immersion to change our relationship with this information and then to interactivity to collaborate with that information differently. So if we're looking at exponential data, we're talking about sensors that are getting more and more refined and capable all the time. And then we're talking about a full stack where we have better AI tools that we can bring off the shelf or computer vision opportunities. How do you see these technologies converging, for instance, in education or, or in other fields uh, to make information more accessible, but also to help us connect better as human beings? Well, you know, in 1985, when Steve Jobs left Apple to make Next, his model was a digital wet lab. He wanted to recapitulate a biology laboratory in, in digital format. And I think that's really, we, we are coming to a point where without glasses or headphones or microphones, uh, kids, people will be able together to learn whether they're in the same place or not about things that they don't have access to, that, that aren't really there. And so there will be a whole new form of conversation about all sorts of things that were never in, the, in, in play before. And I think that that's gonna transform what we think of as a classroom. So uh, have you guys ever heard this, uh, VR is the empathy machine? Anybody ever heard that? Chris Milk. 
<laughs> Who is it by? Chris, Chris, Chris Milk. Chris Milk. Milk. Yeah. See, that's what I was about to say. Yes, <laughs> attribute it to Chris Milk. So people call VR the empathy machine, and I think um, it really comes to life when you experience something like you enter an experience and you're shorter than you are in real life, and you experience the perspective literally of someone who's of a different yeah. height or a different gender or able to swim, right, when, when you can't. And um, I, I live in Austin, Texas. I moved there from the Bay Area about seven months ago, and I was just at a local uh, co-working um, space called Capital Factory and an accelerator, and they have a fund, and they were doing uh, XR pitch competitions, and there were some really good ideas, but the one that won was called Mind, M-Y-N-D, and they are doing VR for senior care, and they showed a really moving video of, um, uh, of some seniors going into VR and doing, and, and basically um, exploring the world in a way that they couldn't anymore, and that helped them kind of take their mind off the four walls that they were in. Um, and I thought that that was really telling and interesting that that won because I think um, I'm, I'm most interested in, in XR for the purpose of augmenting human ability, obviously, but also um, allowing us to extend our empathy for, for others and for different situations and, uh, and really understand the world from different angles than we otherwise could. And so, yeah, I think that's, that's something that is really good. And, and the, actually, I caught an earlier panel today where they were discussing something, another big thing that sort of happened since the early days of AR, VR, and that is that, you know, we are now able to integrate our electronics and our photonics to our bodies. And this is another thing, photonics has changed the game entirely because we're now able through photonics, ways of seeing and being, being that photonics is enabling, to actually really envisage a world where really the eyeglasses are more about your relationship with yourself and your own biology and perceptions. Mm. And I have to say, I've been thinking a lot about where eyewear fits in this because I am not entirely convinced that, well, I mean, I think with what I mentioned dynamic land, I think <clears throat> we do not ideally want screens separating us. We really, if we really want this world of spatial computing, we want, exactly as Brett Victor says, we want to have a full bandwidth experience enhanced by the computers, not, not us fitting into this. But this is something where I think the eyewear is very interesting. And I did ask you about whether you were going to, why you use the earbuds or eyewear if you're just doing audio. But I do think, actually, we're going to see some of the most powerful use cases for eyewear actually to be about perception engineering about mm -hmm. that integration with your, your own biology. Because, of course, the eye is a direct input <laughs> to the brain. And if you, uh, if you want to follow up on, on how far along this kind of stuff is, look at the work of Mary Lou Jepsen mm -hmm. and her new startup, Open Water. She was the head of display at um, Facebook for a while and was, I mean, I, I really, you know, her career trajectory is really interesting because she's also was involved in One Laptop Per Child. Um, but she's focused now on brain imaging. And brain imaging, if you listen to what she's saying, it's not just about, you know, she's working on a cap that's an MRI that's a very, you know, low, low, low cost and low, low, low difficulty to use. But, but that is also imaging the brain means we can communicate with our own brain in a new ways. Mm -hmm. So it's this new ways of being and seeing will also be about how you know we relate to ourselves. And I think the eyewear may well that way, may well be its breakout moment because I mean if you look at AR VR eyewear right now. You know, there's just, we've not, not quite find that product market fit where the, the barrier of mm -hmm. wearing the glass is, an, is equivalent to the value add. And I mean, there's been lots of amazing efforts for people with impaired vision because then it's really useful. Right. <laughs> but, you know, I think, I think we're going to see some, you know, perception e engineering efforts here. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there's a lot of topics to discuss here because, you know, we're... This is the one big thing about spatial computing and having reality as the platform. You know, there's a lot of discussions to have about, you know, trust right. and data yep. Yep. and all of these things. But I have to say, I'm beginning to feel the way I want the world to be is screenless. But I do think I wear as an in interface to myself. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, I can think of like, I want a gauntlet, like Wonder Woman. I want my <laughs> device right here, and then I want the device to disappear. I don't want to have to think yeah. about anything between me and other people. And so barriers to communication or connection seem to hinder this, this new way of being. And um, I'm curious, you, you spoke a little bit to um, some of the barriers around what what's happening in collaboration. Obviously, our technology is moving a lot faster than we can. Um, and sometimes when it comes to things like wearables, we implement something, but we can't necessarily uh, make a good or ethical use of it, right? So we've seen, for instance, wearables that kids are wearing that can be hacked or uh, other solutions where the input device isn't maybe the right choice. And so I, I'm curious, as we begin to think about integration with computer vision and AI and, and, uh, and a number of sticky challenges there, how are you thinking about designing these solutions for people, for people connecting with each other when we're talking about somewhat risky interactive technologies? Well. I have to say, this year I was just really, really fortunate. The first time in my life that I've admired him my whole career is I met Alan Kay in person. And I have to say, you have to, he is still the absolute leader in, in really the deepest level of what counts in computing. I mean, I recommend anyone who, who if you can find anything, he's got some recent talks on, online because he frames the, the, the pro, and he has framed, I mean, remember, this is the person who probably influenced our current day devices more than anyone else in the world. And also, if you've not heard of Alan Kay, he's also the creator of object-oriented programming. And if you listen to him, he still has the magic that a lot of us have forgotten. And that is that fundamentally, all of computing, is centered around you know, communication and collaboration. If you look at his early work and what you know, drove him forward, and he's actually, you know, again, interesting enough, he's for a long time sponsored Dynamic Land. And I think one of the messages that he still has for us today is that we really need to have these, have, look at computing in, an, in a new way. Because the greatest challenges to our society are systems challenges, they're global challenges, and they're communications challenges and education challenges. And, and I know he said this to me. I mean, it is amazing that we still don't really have a conference call down, that we really can't you know, <laughs> look each other in the eye on a simple technology like that. Well, it's not simple. But, but anyway, I think, I think that's you know, it's time for us to think at the level of Alan Kay, if we can, or at least, re at least read and see. That, yeah, it seems know. like we're still in the uncanny valley in a lot of places for technology, where something is supposed to help us uh, collaborate across great distances with greater fidelity than we used to. Yeah. But in point of fact, it's like a 20 minute trial and error every time you get into a conference room. Um, my hope is that we, I, we arrive at a non-dystopian uh, version of that where, where it is seamless, it's more Star Trek-like <coughs> and user-oriented, not so much advertisement and, uh, and kind of like intrusion, you know, notification-oriented. Yeah. I am concerned about that though. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's I mean, I, I think that it's, it's time to look, at, look beyond our very, very narrow understanding of communication and computing right now. Okay. That's what Alan Kay has done his whole career. Um, and I think Alan we need... Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. perhaps we are all vast censors. I see, yes. Network. Anyone here never heard of Alan Kay? It's a good... I think up. there's a display to him downstairs if you want to go look. Yeah, because there, there is. I think, he, I think his anniversary was celebrated here, was it? I think so. I think yeah. so. Um, yeah. We are going to take questions in just a moment. I wanted to ask if there are any other thoughts you wanted to put in before we take a few questions from the audience. Okay, great. Um, for those of you interested in the BCI piece of this conversation, what you were speaking about, Mary Lou Jepsen's work, there's a great new product out today for one of my collaborators, uh, Project Unicorn, 
Uh, so if you don't want headsets, but you want something else that you can hack on with your kids, uh, this is a very simple BCI device that you can play with at home and begin to hack on. It just cool. came out today from a Nook with Fresh. Oh, so cool. it's, it's a BCI. It's, it, yeah, it's designed for BCI hacking at home. It's called oh. Project and Unicorn. It's shaped like a unicorn. It's a unicorn horn. horn. It was designed with autistic youth in mind. That's how it originally was developed. What a great idea. So yeah. it's a fun little fashion play. Uh, are there any questions from the audience on how all of these mixed reality XR and AI pieces fit together. Hello. Uh, so actually, I have two questions. Uh, first, I'm Chris, and I came all the way from Brazil. Yay, and Brazil! Thank you. <laughs> so actually, I want to make one question for Michael uh, regarding the new Bose. Which, which one? It's two Michaels here. Uh, sorry, the Michael from Luden from Bose. Yep. Yeah. Specifically, the new eyewear from Bose that has like the headsets and yeah. the accelerometers. The frame, uh, both frames. Yeah. yeah, so it has, I understand there is like a SDK for it, and even yeah. people doing like an official SDK is hacking it in all ways. Are you so, a plant? Did both <laughs> plant you there? To, no, I, I heard of that. Try not and, to be too advertising here. But, no, no, yeah, happy but, to answer. But I, I want to know like how people are using this device in, yeah. in, in given in ways maybe that surprised you? Because, sure, yeah, definitely and, ways that And because I understand like maybe What's the ecosystem behind? And, yep. Yep. Sure. And I actually want to hear from everybody, if possible. What's your perspective on voice as the user interface, and if you're going to integrate in a more <laughs> screenless <laughs> world like that? Yeah. I'll try to answer the first one really quickly, um, and then that's a good question about voice. Um, so the the Bose AR platform uh, is available at developer.bose.com, and we have mobile SDKs. We're really focused on delivering apps to app stores that are Bose AR enabled, meaning either have a feature that's audio only uh, that can take advantage of some of the gesture recognition that uh, the Bose AR devices have. Um, but just to back up about Bose frames, so frames are the glasses that, that you're seeing, and they are sunglasses. Um, they're the first form factor that we announced Bose AR in. They're not the only one. Um, it's not specifically tied to frames, and I do think that it does confuse people that they have lenses, mm. but there's no screen, they're just sunglasses. So it's like a Bluetooth uh, headset that has extra sensors so you can understand if somebody's nodding or shaking their head or double tapping or what direction they're looking in or you can create custom gesture recognizers where you, know, you recognize when somebody ducks. You can certainly use uh, text-to-speech engines to do voice interaction as a method of, uh, of controlling a, the audio interface. Um, in terms of, so the platform is free, that we're not planning to monetize that. Uh, the value to us is customers who have Bose products um, find value in Bose AR apps. Um, and so in terms of things that I've seen that are kind of unexpected or interesting, I mentioned one example, but there's so many, it's so early, we really need the creativity of like the broadest possible swath of developers that we can get. So we have iOS SDK, Android SDK, and Unity for cross-platform. Um, and they're just deployed as mobile applications in the app stores. And so some of the ones that are out, uh, I actually helped run a game jam in Boston in early February and one of the teams created an app that's actually in the Apple App Store now called uh, Sonic Samurai. Hmm. And I'm really interested in some of these early games because they, they showcase early control mechanisms that might be possible. So for this game, um, basically you're hearing, you're a blind samurai, there's monsters coming at you. You hear them <laughs> coming from specific directions. And you have to use your phone as your sword. And using the gyroscope in the phone, you swing it at the, at the enemy when it's close to you. <laughs> So there's a leaderboard, and you can kind of duck and dodge a little bit. That's a fun, I interesting uh, game use case. There's an interactive spy novel called Comrade AR, mm. where you hear somebody talking to you over your left that's kind of like a computer uh, AI, and it's like, I need you to do this and that, and you have to locate sound. And there's one point at which uh, you have to duck quickly or you'll get shot, and uh, you know, nod if you hear me. Like, Okay. <laughs> and you can look like that crazy person off in a corner, just like talking to themselves. <coughs> um, you know, there's, there's Headspace did a demo with us. Headspace is a meditation app for mobile. Uh, the demo at South by Southwest, um, basically, before you go into meditation, it asks you to do some head rolls, you know, roll it around in a circle. It goes bling when you're done, you know, and it'll be like, all right, stretch right, stretch left. Okay, now, and then you get into the meditation. That's one potential example. New Balance created a rep counting situation where it's gonna encourage you to do jumping jacks. So they created a custom gesture recognizer using the gyroscope where if you, if you do jumping jacks, it, it, jacks, it counts one, two, three, four, five. Push-ups, sit-ups, squats, uh, they recognize all that stuff. So these are all just really early 
tastes almost teases of what's potentially possible. And really the most interesting thing to me is not so much the use case. I'm particularly interested in education and accessibility as, as ways that we can enhance people's lives with, with, with audio interfaces, but also I, I'm really interested in what does a really good spatial audio interface look like? And I'll just end with one more example. Um, so there's a company called Otocast, which does walking tours. We've got a lot of interest from people who do walking tours. It makes a lot of sense for a number of reasons. Um, and this app, I helped them actually create their first uh, stab at an, a spatialized audio uh, interface. And so with this app, it uses GPS from the phone, and it uses compass heading from the device, and uh, so it knows what direction you're looking in. And if you have the app open on your phone, and that's, that's a way that we're avoiding the whole dystopian uh, uh, output where you know, maybe you get advertised to constantly, you have to actually opt to download the app and keep it open on your phone, then put that phone in your pocket and specifically connect the Bose AR features. So, um, so with this app, you, you do that, you're walking down the street, you'll hear a spatial ping that's like attached to a building, um, and if there's an audio tour there. And it's just a light touch thing, it's not gonna bother you if you're talking to friends walking along the street. You can turn towards it, double tap, it'll tell you the title of a tour, you can double tap again, and it will start playing a walking tour. It's just mm. full sound, but it's geofenced. So if you leave the area, it will ask you to nod if you wanna continue the walking tour, and if not, you're popped back out in this spatial audio experience with pin, pings. Hmm. So those are a few of the interesting examples. Audio connects people. I think we have just about a minute left, so I wanna be able to give each of you a moment to uh, speak into, is there anything you wanna give this audience about new ways of being to look forward to in our field? I want a minute to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can just recap. Um, I think that really, what we're talking about is this, an era of spatial computing. What does that mean? That means reality is the platform. The reality includes you and now your biology too because we can interface with that. I think that the spatial computing is defined by natural interaction. I think you mentioned the voice and that doesn't mean gestures. We're not gonna have these screens where people are doing this and making up a language to talk like this. It's gonna be natural. So your point is when you need to point, you'll talk when you need to talk and you will look when you need to look. So I think that is multimodal, but natural is where, where we're going. And I think also, don't get too fixated on screens. We're trying to get out of the, we, the uh, we're shifting to an era where we don't actually need these screens between us anymore. So don't get too fixated on just eyewear or contact lenses or goggles. Think of this, you know, think of it, think of this as a, a, you know, this is an opportunity to have the appropriate technology to what you want to do. If you want to collaborate and code together, you shouldn't have to be in a cubicle. So I think that's it. And, and, and oh, actually to mention the AI, um, essentially this is really critical because this is what all of this will have, it will have intelligence and proactivity. So proactivity is now part of this. And what does that mean in these? All of these experiences, you have to include that word because now we have this built into our devices. What does it mean? Where does it fit? But anyway. Well, I think most of us here figured out how to learn in spite of school and probably are pretty good at helping our own kids do that. So I'm looking forward to using technology, to having technology advance to the point where kids don't have to fight school to learn. Well, I love that we're bringing it all right into your hands, Michael. Oh, yeah, so just really quickly, um, two, two quick things I'm really excited about. One is, uh, and now, I, what was it called, the uh, ad adventure? What? Oh, Dynamic Land. Dynamic Land, there yeah, we you go. Can, um, it's in Oakland, so I think you can arrange to visit, have community events. I actually gave a talk at AWE last year, and I gave a story mm. that kind of highlighted this concept, but I'm really interested in physical code. Like, I want code to become something that is akin to being a mechanic, like a real mechanic, where you're working on a car. Okay, and you have to go tactile. to dynamic. I mean, I know, I know, I do. Essentially, yeah. the concept is you're actually inside the computer, and every That's object awesome. is part of your That's computing. Awesome. This and keep an eye out on them. Go, yeah. go visit one of their computers, because they are really, have a really wonderful project, which is about new design tools for hardware in innovators. Because as you all know, when you're working with hardware, it's not as easy just to sort of like quickly change something and see the, go, go visit for that, because that's one of their, I think they call it 
don't know what they're calling the project, but they have it set up. And if you're a hardware designer here, that's a really important thing to have new tools available. So that's for you. one. The other one I would just say is uh, creating new senses. Um, there's a magnetic belt, and then there's something called North Ball you can wear on your foot that will buzz in the direction of magnetic north. And for people who are not visually impaired, it's very effective at kind of giving you a tingle, like a sixth mm -hmm. sense for direction. I'm really interested in concepts like that that can actually augment our abilities. New, New ways. ways of being and interacting. Thank you for joining us, Michael, <laughs> Tish, and Michael. All right, thank you all so much. Stick around for our next panel starting in just a couple minutes.